Welcome to Module 8. Module 8 provides an overview of the outcome measures that we will employ in the grand trial to characterize effectiveness of the networked neuroprosthesis. This module introduces the GRASP release test, our primary outcome measure, as well as secondary measures such as the COPM, ADL abilities test, and the SKIM3 self-care scale. We will also discuss how NNP system satisfaction and usage will be measured. By completion of this learning module, participants will understand the difference between primary and secondary outcome assessments, identify time points at which each outcome measure is administered, describe the goals of the GRT and how it is administered, list the steps for conducting a COPM, define how the ADL abilities test is used to quantify COPM performance, and understand the methods for measuring system satisfaction and usage. Before we dig in, it's important to understand the assessment time points. In Module 5, we discussed the study timeline at length. This table summarizes the time points at which the primary and secondary outcome measures are administered. As you recall, the critical time point for administering our primary outcome measure, the GRT, is at the three-month visit. However, it's important to administer the test at six months and 12 months to measure function over time. Now we will review each measure individually for a better understanding of what the assessments measure and how they are administered. First up, we will discuss our primary outcome measure, the GRT. The GRT will be administered within one month prior to NNP implantation and repeated at three months, six months, and one year post-implantation. The GRASP and Release Test, or GRT, is a pick-and-place test of object acquisition. There are six objects ranging in size and weight. Three of the objects, the peg, weight, and fork, measure lateral prehension. The remaining three objects, the block, can, and videotape, measure palmer or five-finger prehension. The test objects are surrogates for things that we encounter in daily activities, such as finger foods, books, beverage cans, or utensils. The test consists of three parts, measurement of grasp strength, a pretest, and a main test. The pretest assesses whether the participant can acquire and release each object and is scored as either pass or fail. The main test includes three test trials for each object successfully passed in the pretest. Each trial lasts 30 seconds, during which completions and errors are counted. We will review each part of the test thoroughly in the next several slides. Grasp strength is measured at the start of each GRT using a modified BNDL pinch meter. The L-shaped modification better accommodates the tetraplegic hand. It's important to understand that this modification affects the force measurements. Therefore, to get a true reading of force, the number on the dial must be divided by a conversion factor. Each pinch meter has its own conversion factor, which is approximately 3. GRASP strength values are recorded on page 1 of the GRASP release test form. There is space to add values for all three GRASP modes, with and without the NNP. The plus sign indicates values recorded with the NNP on. The minus sign indicates values recorded with the NNP off. Once GRASP strength values are measured and all other setup activities are completed, the GRASP release test commences with a pretest. The pretest assesses whether participants can acquire, hold, and release each of the six objects. Only objects successfully passed in the pretest are tested in the main test. During the GRT pretest, the participant attempts to acquire, move, and release each of the six objects for a minimum of 30 seconds. Participants can practice longer if desired. Additional practice is beneficial if a participant is close to passing an object but just needs a little extra practice. The pretest uses pass fail scoring. Therefore, successfully completing even one object counts as a pass. General errors to look for include dropping the object, missing the object, touching the test box, supinating the forearm to help hold the object, or uncontrolled release of the object. There are some errors specific to each object. We will review those in Module 8b, a deep dive on the GRT. 
At the end of each trial and optional practice time, if the participant fails an object, the examiner asks, have you given this your best effort? If the participant says yes, move on to the next object. If the participant says no, encourage the participant to try again, giving their best effort. If, during the 30-second trial plus optional practice time, the participant passes an object, the examiner asks, have you had enough practice? If the participant says yes, move on to the next object. If the participant says no, allow more practice until the participant feels they have had enough time. GRT pretest scores are recorded on page 2 of the GRT form. As with strength measurements, performance with and without the NNP is recorded by the plus sign or minus sign, respectively. The test begins with the three lateral objects, followed by three palmer objects. Therefore, participants should attempt to grasp the peg, weight, and fork using their NNP in lateral mode, and the block, can, and tape using their palmer mode. If a participant cannot pass an object with the prescribed mode, they may try to use their alternate grasp mode. For example, if Eleanor is unable to acquire the tape with her palmer mode, she may try to acquire it with her lateral mode. If successful, this would be indicated by the at symbol. Additional information about the GRT pretest will be covered in Module 8b, A Deep Dive on the GRT. The main test immediately follows the pretest. Again, only the objects that were successfully passed in the pretest are included in the main test. Three 30 second trials of each object will be scored for completions and errors. More details about scoring completions and errors will be included in the GRT deep dive. At completion of the main test, participant feedback is sought. The participant is asked to verify whether or not they gave the test their best effort, whether the test board was in an optimal position, and whether the examiner interfered with their performance during any aspects of the test. Main test performance is scored on pages 3 and 4 of the GRT form. Objects are presented in a random order within each set, as you will note under sets 1 and 2. Participant feedback is recorded on the last page of the GRT form. Since the GRT is our primary outcome measure, we have developed additional training in its administration to be completed by the study therapists. Next, we will discuss the COPM, one of our secondary outcome measures. The COPM is a semi-structured interview that enables an open dialogue between the study participant and therapist about issues of importance to the participant. Administering the COPM draws on a therapist's expertise and experience in occupation-based client-centered practice. We will use the COPM in the grand trial to assist study participants in identifying goals that they would like to achieve with an implanted NNP for upper limb function. The COPM will be administered within one month prior to NNP implantation and again at three months, six months, and one year after implantation. The key data collection time point for the pivotal trial is three months post-implantation. However, data collected at six months and one year will provide important information about longer-term maintenance or even additional changes or improvements in function. There are several steps in the COPM. Key steps include, in order, identifying problems in functional performance, rating importance of each of the problems, selecting problematic activities and identifying goals to address, scoring perception of current performance of activities and satisfaction of that performance, and finally, reassessment of the goals. We will look at each step in more detail. The COPM uses a semi-structured interview. The therapist initiates the COPM process by engaging the client in identifying daily occupations of importance that they want to do, need to do, or are expected to do, but are unable to accomplish. Areas of everyday living explored during the interview include self-care, productivity, or leisure. For the purposes of the grand trial, participants are asked to focus on activities they would like to be able to perform with the NNP. 
This can include activities that they already perform, but would like to perform more easily or with less assistance from other people or adaptive equipment. Participants may also identify completely new activities that they are currently unable to do. Please watch this short video provided by COPM developers for a very brief example of the problem definition step of the COPM. Joan, thank you so much for coming in today. My name is Mary Ann, and we're here today to do a COPM interview, or Canadian Occupational Performance Measure. I'm going to be using this form, and you're welcome to see anything that I'm writing down. We're, we'll, we're doing this together, okay. so we'll, uh, we'll make sure that uh, everything that I write down you're happy with and you feel like is a true reflection of what you're telling me. What we want to do is identify some things that you might like to work on and that we might be able to work on together. Mm -hmm. And those are typically things that you'd like to be doing but you can't do or things that you need to be doing but uh, you're, you're not able to do at okay. the moment. Or even things that other people expect you to do but you can't do. Tell me about your morning routine. Let's start off with how your day starts. Uh, well, I'm, I find it hard actually to get up in the morning because I'm usually basic things like the laundry basket. Just lifting that, I've got, I'm in a three story. It's funny when you say, does your day feel full? Um, it feels full because all of the little things that I have to do fill up the day, but they're not meaningful things to me. Okay. Like it's getting stuff done and that fills my day, but it's not with the stuff I want to do, which okay. is being at work. Morning. Yeah. Let me just recap what I've got here. Um, trouble getting started in the morning. Do you feel like I've missed anything? Is there anything else you want to put on that uh, docket that I've missed? Um, no, that's, I mean, I feel like, I guess the biggest thing is I'm really frustrated right now. Once the therapist is confident that the participant has identified the occupational performance problems experienced in everyday living, the second step of the COPM process is undertaken. In step two, the participant is asked to rate the importance of each of the problems identified using a 10-point rating scale, ranging from 1, not important at all, to 10, extremely important. Please take some time to view this brief video provided by the COPM developers for an example of rating importance of problems during the COPM. Um, Joan, I'm going to try and get a sense from you about how these things play out in your life and how important they are to you. Okay. And so let me just give you this little card that shows a scale of importance from one being not very important at all to 10 being extremely important. Okay. And I'm going to go through those problems that we've talked about and invite you to give me a sense of, mm -hmm. from your rating of how important each of those things is for you. Okay. So let's start with the morning routine, the whole business of getting started in the morning and getting your day underway. Um, I would say that's um, probably a five. Okay. For the third step of the COPM, the participant chooses up to five of the most important problems that were identified in step two. The therapist can help the participant to focus on activities that were rated the highest in importance, and these activities will be targeted for training both with and without the network neuroprosthesis. This is an important step, and the therapist should encourage participants to choose activities that are achievable during occupational therapy visits in the clinic by using equipment that's already available or easy to bring in for home. A key requirement of this step is to set goals that are specific, measurable, and attainable. Please view this video for a very brief example of selecting problems for scoring during the COPM. Based 
based on those ratings, mm -hmm. number one seems to be the daytime activities and spending your day in a way that is worthwhile and meaningful to you. Yeah. Second one is uh, having the kind of relationship you want to have with your daughter. And then sort of tied for third place is the morning routine and mm -hmm. leisure. Now that some specific, measurable, and achievable goals have been set, Step 4 of the COPM requires participants to use a 10-point scale to rate their current level of performance and satisfaction with that performance for each of the five identified problems or activities. The therapist asks, how would you rate the way you do this activity now? The participant rates performance ranging from 1, not able to do it, to 10, able to do it extremely well. The therapist follows up by asking, how satisfied are you with the way you do this activity now? The participant rates satisfaction ranging from 1, not satisfied at all, to 10, extremely satisfied. Please take some time to watch this video for a very brief example of scoring performance and satisfaction during the COPM. I'd like to get a sense from you of how you think you're doing now with those things and how satisfied you are. Okay. So that when we look back after, okay. you know, a few weeks, we'll okay. be able to see if we've made a difference. Okay. Let's do them one at a time. There's the performance scale okay. and it goes from one not able to do it at all mm -hmm. up to 10 able to do it extremely well. So I'll ask you about each of those four things again. Um, the first one, the one that you said is most important, is uh, your ability to work or to mm -hmm. spend the main part of your day in a way that's meaningful and feels worthwhile mm -hmm. to you. How do you think you're doing right now at that? One, well, not able to yeah, do it at all. I'm, I'm not doing it well at all. Okay. I would say I'm at a, a one. If we can make a distinction between how you're doing and how satisfied you are with how you're Doing. That's what I'm going to ask you now. Okay. One, not satisfied at all. Ten, totally satisfied. Okay. How satisfied are you now with how you spend the main part of your day? Uh, not satisfied. I'm, I'm at a, like a one, I okay. guess. The fifth and final step of the COPM process takes place at the completion of intervention or at a predetermined time after intervention was initiated. For the grand trial, the three-month mark is important for measuring efficacy of the NNP. During the reassessment, the therapist asks the participant to re-rate performance and satisfaction with the NNP for activities that were addressed. The therapist then uses these scores to calculate the performance and satisfaction change scores. Please watch this video for a very brief example of COPM client reassessment. So look at these problems and sort of start to figure out what we might be able to do together and mm -hmm. how I might be able to suggest things that might help. Okay. And after a certain period of time that we'll decide on, we will uh, look again and see if we made a difference. Here is the COPM form for recording data. Please keep in mind that the COPM is a measure that must be purchased, so we here in Cleveland will be in touch with you about arrangements for securing this measure. Next, we will discuss the ADL Abilities Test as a supplemental quantitative measure of activity performance. The ADL Abilities Test is a scale or approach to activity analysis that can further quantify changes in the performance of activities identified by study participants in the COPM. Since the ADL Abilities Test is administered in tandem with the COPM, the timeline for testing is nearly identical, with one exception. The ADL Abilities Test is not administered prior to NNP implantation. 
It is administered at 3, 6, and 12 months post-implantation to measure differences in activity performance with the NNP on and off. The ADL Abilities Test was originally developed to compare ADL performance with and without previous generations of our center's neuroprosthetic technologies. Training in activity performance both with and without the NNP is built into the ADL Abilities Test. To get a true vision of the impact of the NNP, participants are encouraged to perform tasks as independently as possible, both with and without the NNP system. In addition to the amount of assistance required to perform an activity, study participants are also asked to report whether they prefer to perform the task with the NNP and to weigh in on the quality of the outcome of the task. The activities of focus are chosen by the participant in the COPM. In the next few slides, we will talk about the quantitative process of breaking down tasks and scoring the phases. Activity analysis is used to break each activity down into measurable steps or phases. Each phase is scored to reflect the level of assistance a participant requires to complete the phase successfully. This ability scale reflects the levels of assistance that may be required. The scale ranges from the most dependent level of requiring physical assistance from another person to perform part of a task to complete independence. Adaptive equipment is scored for phases where a device or adaptation is necessary. Orthotic assistance is scored if a participant wears a wrist brace or orthosis as part of their daily routine. If the orthosis has a utensil pocket that the participant uses for eating, then only orthotic assistance is scored, not adaptive equipment, since the pocket is part of the orthosis that they wear all day. If, however, a participant does not typically wear an orthosis all day, but puts it on only for eating, then the orthosis would be scored as adaptive equipment. Self-assistance is scored when a participant performs a phase of a task in a manner that is different than performance by a non-disabled person. Examples of this would be use of two hands for something that would typically only be performed with one, using one's mouth, or sliding an object to the edge of a table to acquire it instead of picking it straight up off of the table. It's important to understand that more than one level of ability may be scored in a given phase. For example, if a participant wears an orthosis but also requires an adaptation to an object, then both OA, orthotic assistance, and AE, adaptive equipment, would be scored. Here is an example of how the activity of eating with a utensil is broken down into phases. Remember that ADL training is done both with the NNP on and off, therefore there are two separate sections on the form on which to record data. Using standard activity analysis, eating with a utensil has been broken down into the following phases. Acquire the utensil, hold the utensil, stab or scoop with the utensil, lift and lower utensil, and release. The beginning and end of phases, marked with an asterisk, are considered setup or takedown phases that are only completed once at the beginning or end of an activity. The phases in between, that are repeated many times during a meal, are called performance phases. Requiring assistance from another person in the beginning or end of a task only is considered more independent than if assistance is required during the repetitive performance phases of the activity. Next, we will review a scenario and apply the ability scale. This is an example of scoring for the task of eating with a utensil. Participant Atul is participating in ADL training both with and without the NNP. In his pre-implantation COPM, Atul reported reliance on a universal cuff with a bent fork that his spouse would place in his hand. He has identified a goal of eating without using any adaptive devices with his NNP. After ADL training with the NNP off, Atul was still reliant on the universal cuff, despite attempting many different approaches to weaving the utensil between his fingers or using two hands, both of which would be slightly more independent than relying on adaptive equipment. However, Atul discovered that he was able to put on and take off the universal cuff without someone helping him by using his mouth to tighten and loosen the strap. How should Atul's ability without the NNP be scored? 
since a tool still requires a universal cuff with a bent fork in order to eat without the NNP, adaptive equipment, or AE, is scored for each phase of the activity. Since he is able to put on and take off his universal cuff without assistance from anyone else, physical assistance, or PA, is not scored. However, since a tool has to use his mouth to tighten and loosen the strap, self-assistance is scored for the phases acquire and release. After ADL training with the NNP turned on, a tool was able to hold a regular fork without relying on adaptive equipment. Therefore, adaptive equipment is not scored. However, he needed to use his other hand to position the fork in just the right position in his NNP hand to stab into the food, so self-assistance is scored in the acquire phase. If a tool was able to pick up the fork and manipulate it into the right position without using his other hand, self-assistance would not be scored. At the end of the task, a tool was able to open his hand to release the fork without using his other hand to assist. Therefore, self-assistance is not scored for the release phase. A tool used his lateral grasp mode to perform this activity, and this is recorded in the mode column. He locked his grasp into the closed position during the performance phases of the activity. This is recorded by adding an L to the mode column for the hold, stab, and lift lower phases of the activity. Preference. After ADL training and scoring is completed with and without the NNP, participants are asked to report their preference for performing the activity, either with or without the NNP. Participants are encouraged to make this decision based on the level of independence, any equipment or adaptive devices used, quality of the performance, effort expended, and cosmesis. Factors that should not enter into this decision include how they typically perform the activity at home, accessibility issues, availability of an attendant, habits, or social expectations. Quality. In addition to scoring level of ability and measuring the participant's preferred method of activity performance, the quality of the outcome of the activity is compared with the NNP on versus off. In many cases, the quality of the activity outcome will be the same, and here's why. The primary goal of training participants in activity performance with and without the NNP is to gain the most accurate view of differences in performance as a result of the NNP. Whether the system is on or off, we want the quality of the activity outcome to reflect the way a participant would actually do an activity. For example, during eating, if participant Paul is able to stab into a bite of food, but the food frequently falls off of his fork before getting it to his mouth, the quality of the outcome is poor, and Paul is not likely to feed himself in that manner. In that situation, ADL training is necessary for the best method of activity performance, regardless of whether the NNP is on or off. Some activities may demonstrate a clear difference in the quality of the activity outcome. For example, writing may be legible both with the NNP on and off, but might be neater with the NNP. In that case, the quality would be scored as better with the NNP. The ADL Abilities Test is supplemental to the COPM and provides additional quantification of task performance. The approach is flexible in that it can be applied to a variety of different ADL using an activity analysis approach that is familiar to occupational therapists. Data can be analyzed both across participants and across different types of activities using Roche analysis. This allows participants to choose activities that are meaningful to them, rather than having to adhere to a preset bank of activities that may not be as personally important. While the ADL abilities test is specific to hand function in people with tetraplegia, the grand study is also employing the spinal cord independence measure, version 3, self-care scale, which is widely used in spinal cord injury care. The next several slides will discuss our use of the SKIM-3 self-care scale in the grand study. The SKIM-3 is a disability scale developed specifically for the SCI population to assess various activities of daily living. It has become one of the most frequently used research tools for assessing response to treatments in individuals with SCI. 
Many other outcome measures are not specific or sensitive enough to detect important functional changes in individuals with SCI over time. For the GRAND trial, we will only collect data on the self-care scale, which will be administered by interview. Participants are instructed to answer the questions regarding their current ability. The SKIM-3 will be administered within one month prior to NNP implantation and at three months, six months, and one year after implantation. The self-care scale of the SKIM-3 consists of six items related to feeding, bathing, dressing, and grooming. Bathing and dressing have separate assessments of upper and lower body activity performance. Here is the SKIM-3 item on feeding. During the interview, the therapist instructs participants to think about how they eat and drink, considering their performance cutting food, opening containers, pouring, bringing food to their mouth, and holding cups with fluid in them. Participants indicate whether they need assistance from another person or any adaptive devices in order to perform the activity. For bathing, tasks are broken down by upper and lower body performance. For upper body bathing, the participant is instructed to consider washing their upper body and head, including soaping and drying and using faucets, as well as the amount of assistance they require from other people or adaptive devices and adapted settings. Higher scores indicate higher levels of independence. Similar instructions and considerations are given to participants when assessing lower body bathing. As with upper body bathing, a score of 0 or 1 indicates at least some reliance on caregivers to complete the activity, while 2 indicates reliance on adapted devices or a specific setting. Assessing dressing activities requires consideration of different types of clothing and the challenges they pose, such as manipulating buttons, zippers, and laces. Again, scoring indicates whether there is reliance on assistance from another person, adaptive equipment, or a specific setting. The same rules apply to scoring lower body dressing, with considerations for type and difficulty of clothing and the amount of assistance required. Grooming includes a number of personal care activities, such as washing your hands and face, brushing teeth, shaving, applying makeup, and managing hair care. Scoring is similar to other items on the self-care scale. To assess the impact of the NNP on activity performance, scores of the SKIM-3 prior to implantation will be compared to scores post-implantation. To wrap up our overview of outcome assessments, we will briefly discuss how the GRAND trial will assess participant satisfaction with and usage of the NNP. The Neuroprosthesis Satisfaction Survey was developed by researchers at the Cleveland FES Center and was utilized as part of a previous multi-center study. This should be done by self-report. This survey was chosen to measure the impact of an upper extremity neuroprosthesis from the perspective of the participant. Domains include life impact, ADL performance, independence, occupation, appearance, and general satisfaction. Additionally, the NNP system has the capacity to record usage of the system. This is called data logging. Data logging information retrieved from the implant shows adherence to exercise regimens and the degree to which the neuroprosthesis is activated in functional modes. By completing this learning module, you hopefully have an understanding of the differences between the GRAND trial's primary and secondary outcome assessments, can identify the time points at which each outcome measure is administered, are able to discuss the goals of the GRT and how it's administered, list the steps for conducting a COPM, and define how ADL abilities test is used to quantify COPM goal performance. Finally, you should have an understanding of the methods for measuring NNP system satisfaction and usage. Next up, we will be taking a deep dive on our primary outcome measure, the GRT.